if you list it to the left, uh, actually not prioritized, so all of them are very important. And then to the right are three questions that we've been worrying just in the past months, actually. And um, each of them actually was not anticipated. The world financial crisis, the Arab Spring, the Japan earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. And now, recently, I should add actually another problem. Um, this new um, disease that's spreading at the moment, uh, unfortunately, in Germany, where I'm coming from, and nobody can make sense of it so far. Well, the problem is that um, actually we don't know too much about global techno-socioeconomic systems today. And actually, let's have Jean-Claude Trichet speak in his own words. He is the president of the European Central Bank and he recently gave a speech saying, when the crisis came, the serious limitation of existing economic and financial models immediately became apparent. We felt abandoned by conventional tools. And he proceeds actually by saying, okay, I wish that economists would talk more to people from other sciences, such as physicists, biologists, and others. So that is actually what future ICT will do. will bring together people from different fields. So, basically, in order to catch up with the pace at which uh, humanity is facing new crises, we need to come up with a knowledge accelerator. And how to do that? Basically, we have to bring together knowledge from the natural sciences with knowledge from the engineering and the social sciences. And uh, that is going to create this techno social economic knowledge accelerator. We have to create synergy effects. We have to make a project as ambitious as an Apollo project in order really to face these challenges. Now the problem, the question is, why do we have so many problems at all? And some of them are actually pretty old, um, but some of them have been intensifying and becoming uh, more complicated. And uh, the issue is that through globalization and technological change, the interdependency in the system has largely increased. And that has implications. It creates complexity in socio-economic, ecological, and technological systems. And we know that complex systems, now as a scientific term, show a number of interesting features, such as self-organization, emergence, chaos sometimes, turbulence, and so on, and for sure, the limits of predictability and control. Now, we're not completely helpless or without tools in this area. Complex designs exist uh, for a long time, and so we do have ideas of how complex systems behave, and one typical feature is that cause and effects are not proportional to each other. Rather, we find often something like systemic shifts. So if we try to manipulate uh, social or economic systems, then in many cases it's kind of resistant to the attempts to change it. We have experienced that. Some politicians <laughs> uh, could tell as well. So basically there is little response, but then at so-called tipping points, Sometimes, quite unexpectedly, the system changes, changes its character, its behavior, and that's called a systemic shift. And then also, we are quite surprised that some of these uh, regime shifts can be quite catastrophic or problematic for society, such as the breakdown of political regimes, breakdown of the former GDR, was such an example, but also the political revolutions in some Arab countries are such an example, but also the nature of the interbank market and some other examples shown over here uh, could be taken to illustrate that behavior. Now the problem is to make this knowledge practically applicable. And we have not been very good in the past to do that. 
and partially because we didn't have these models. Now, we didn't have these models because there was lack of data. The data situation in social sciences is completely different from, say, physics or biology, where we have huge amounts of data. And that is now going to change also for the social sciences, because, um, as I'll come back later on and demonstrate that, we now have really a big amount of data available that allows us to gain new insights into these systems. And many of the problems actually have a cascading nature. And um, one of the problems actually of uh, complex systems is that they behave in an unexpected ways, sometimes counterintuitive, and that comes from the network and feedback effects. And uh, these feedback effects can actually uh, cause these cascading effects as well. So here is an example that gives you a good intuition actually of cascading effects. You can see a number of table tennis balls fixed in mouse traps. And then it starts off actually with one single perturbation in the system. And that finally creates a global impact. Now the question is what can we learn from such a picture? Well, one could say maybe the way blackouts happen is very much along these lines. So here is an example that happened in Europe, November 4, 2006. Just one single electrical connection had to be turned off in order to transfer a ship. And it turned out that that created a cascading failure with blackouts all over Europe. You wouldn't think that's possible. And also, obviously, it's quite difficult to explain in what areas exactly the blackout would occur. But that is just a typical example of the cascading effect and also the complexity of these kinds of systems and how hard to predict they are. But there are cascading effects in other systems as well. I'm not saying they're all the same, by the way. Of course, they're all different depending on the network and the character of interaction and dynamics in the system and so on. But at least these pictures can help us to find a starting point for the analysis of how the problem propagates in the system. So the subprime crisis, actually, that was substantial, but it could have been dealt with with the money that uh, governments uh, could set aside. But then, through a cascading effect, as you can see, that eventually mortgage companies uh, were affected, lenders, home builders, markets, the uh, US economy, and also the world economy. Now, now we are worrying actually about the stability of Europe and uh, the European currency and all these kinds of things. So, that created an amplification of the problem by a factor of 25, just as big as we can hardly handle it and maybe we will actually fail to get control of that. Now, the question is, was it really unforeseeable that such a crisis could happen? And many people argue, okay, look, in social economic systems, can we do any prediction at all? Well, certain things, I think, can, can be predicted. So, when you look at these curves down on the right, then you can see that uh, in the U.S., consumptions at a certain point were higher than the wages. And it's kind of logical that that could not continue forever. So somehow in the system, in this kind of case, the financial system, a certain stress built up. And it was clear that sooner or later that uh, stress in the system would be released. In a similar way, actually also we have political revolutions where it happens that governments and the people drift away from each other 
and stress builds up in the system that sooner or later will be released. And actually, it can be considered as a cascading effect. Uh, hopefully, I did not break down. It's okay. Um, take the moment. This is just a very big figure, so it takes a little bit of time. So here's an analysis of a colleague that shows that there is a transition from hierarchical systems to democracies that pretty much spreads like a scaling effect. So in the beginning you see there were just a few democracies out in Europe and then eventually it spread to a larger and larger area. So why shouldn't that happen in the Arabic world? And in fact, there are numbers that allow you to estimate when such a transition would happen. So if you look at the diagram down there, it shows the GDP per person US dollar on the one hand over the fertility in children per woman. And it turns out that there is a pretty sharp line separating the hierarchical political regimes from the democratic regimes. And a colleague of mine has done an analysis to show that actually that has kind of a predictive value, this diagram, and a prediction also for a number of countries where we have now seen actually political revolutions happening. And it also predicts that China will not uh, have the political regime they're having at the moment forever. So that has uh, important implications, of course, because we have made ourselves very much dependent on production in China. A lot of companies are producing stuff for us, and in some areas it's um, more than 50% or 90% of all production. So one should keep that in mind. Uh, of course, that could have serious implications for global supply chains. And here is a picture of what could happen when an earthquake strikes. You don't need to read everything. Uh, <laughs> Something terrible. Something terrible, that's correct. And, and so a few years ago, we actually did this kind of analysis of so-called causality network dependencies for a number of different disasters, including earthquakes. And that showed us basically that there is a certain typical sequence in which we have a course of events after disasters. So it basically says that has implications on the breakdown of the phone network, the infrastructure, um, up to actually uh, impacts on the political regime. So for example, in a number of European countries there were elections and uh, these elections were very much influenced also by the disaster in Japan. And now even there was a decision in Germany and in Switzerland to turn away from nuclear energy towards uh, other energy sources. So you can see a single event such as the one in Japan can have global impacts and that could have been anticipated in fact. So, um, what to do about all this? Now, Future ICT has the general mission uh, to understand and learn how to manage socially interactive systems in a sustainable and resilient way. And there are two sides of this project, actually. One is uh, kind of the trying to save the world side, which is on the right-hand side, and then there is the uh, left-hand side, which is focused on information and communication technologies that will create new kinds of information communication technologies, social ICT, socially adaptive ICT, for example. We'll come back to this later on. So, first of all, in order to be able to understand the social world, we need to create new methods and tools, and ICT is very important for that, as well as complexity science. So, basically, the plan is to bring together these three pillars, 
information communication technologies, within social sciences and complexity science. And together, by uh, creating these synergy effects, uh, we'll be able to address these different challenges. So, in the end, uh, we want to have a scientific outcome, which is the ability to understand our global social system, but there's also a technological outcome, which is the ability to manage our global techno-socioeconomic systems, and there will be many technologies on the way that will be sparked off. Let's start off with socially inspired ICT. So, what is this? Well, we, we are planning to come up with uh, new technologies that are socially aware, that means that are going to respond adaptively to the user and the context of the user and also to groups of people. Um, will help uh, to quantify the impact of our decision making and our action on the world. So that will create awareness actually of what we are doing, with it, of the implications of our behavior. And will also facilitate socially inspired bottom up self organization. Just to give an idea of the economic potential of these new kinds of technologies, just take Facebook. Uh, which now has about the value of 65 billion US dollars. So that is just one example. Actually, social systems have many features that are interesting uh, for information communication technologies, which is coordination, cooperation, communication, trust, and many other issues that would be nice to have in, sort of, uh, in ICT systems. And not all of them are implemented already culture as well, uh, some of it is ongoing. Um, why is an understanding of society important for future ICT systems? Well, first of all, ICT systems are crucial for our existence today. If you would turn out ICT systems for just a week, nothing would work anymore. You could not get money from a public television, you could not buy anything, you cannot, uh, could not get fuel, you could not make phone calls, you could not work at your computer and send emails or anything. So basically, you know, society would not work without ICT. <coughs> However, we cannot really be sure that information and communication technologies will work in a stable way in the future. Um, and actually, there are examples from my field of research that show that the more you network the system, the more unstable it can become, up to a complete breakdown of the system. So what worked in the past and making things more connected may not work in the future. And actually, ICT systems are made up of billions of components that are interacting with each other, many of them with some degree of autonomy. Take your computers, your mobile phones, and also all the people interacting with your system. So, this is basically something like a social system. If we don't understand how a social system works, how do we want to create a social system that's working well? So, if we don't understand it well, we'll create a system that has all the problems that society has, including crime war, instability, and so on and so on. And certainly we can't afford that to happen. So also from this technological point of view, we need to understand how social systems work. Okay, here just a few examples of what can be done. Social sensing, actually, that can be used uh, to improve the traffic situation. Um, just heard Sandy Penton talking some days ago, and he basically stated that our systems are broken. The financial system, the health system, the traffic system. I was a little bit puzzled that he was saying that so openly, um, because he said it as if everybody would agree. And, uh, 
And then he said, okay, look, we will have to reinvent these systems and basically we have to come up with decentralized adaptive strategy for this kind of system. For that, we need huge amounts of data and these data are becoming available. So here's just one example, actually, how it can work from my previous research. We were starting off with a simulation of a traffic breakdown We'll see you stop the go waves going on over here, and then we use a trick that most drivers can't use. We'll get out of the car, take a helicopter in order to see an elevated view, and that elevated view will show us what is the reason for the stop and go traffic. There's some equations behind that which I don't show you in order not to shock you. Um, <laughs> And what you can see over here, there is an on-ramp, so a few cars try to get into the freeway and they're causing perturbations that creates the stop-and-go waves finally. Uh, there is of course a feedback mechanism that creates the stop-and-go waves. And then the question is, can we get rid of the stop-and-go waves? So what we've done now is, we have changed the interactions between cars, assuming that we turned on a driver assistance system that we have created, a kind of adaptive cruise control in principle. And that has been created in a way that stabilizes traffic flow and also slightly increases capacity of the flow. So although the inflow stays the same in that simulation, we get rid of uh, the congestion. And actually, there is another example that I'd like to show you, which is uh, even more breathtaking, of course, it's uh, more complicated than that, which is urban congestion. And I'd like to take it as an example for a problem with limited resources, which is time and space over here. Space and capacity are limited in this uh, system. And the question is you now, how can you improve the situation in such a system? It's also a system which is typical because it's networked, it's dynamic, it's, it's complex, um, and uh, it has a, a number of different feedback effects, and moreover, it's difficult to control because there is a large degree of variability in the system. That means the number of cars arriving during one red light is varying as much as the average value is. So the standard deviation is as big or even bigger than the average value. And that's characteristic actually for many systems today. So classical control approaches don't work very well, it turns out. These top-down approaches um, and we need to have a different approach. So basically what we said at that time, let's reinvent traffic line control. And when we started this project, we had some ideas, but we didn't know whether we would manage to model our way through. When we wanted to reinvent things and to make it more difficult, we said let's do it without central control, just try to find interaction rules between traffic lights that would allow traffic lights to coordinate locally and through self-organization this local coordination would spread through the system and see whether that works. So basically we came up with a self-control principle and it's really revolutionary because it's completely different from what we're doing today. Today there is a traffic control center and that gets information from all the traffic lights very expensive to have all the buyers and so on and so on. And then you have a supercomputer that's trying to do a systematic optimization of the, the traffic lights. But there's so many things that you can learn, the green times, uh, the order in which you serve different directions and so on, and so on the phase shifts and so on. You cannot do that in real time even with a supercomputer. So you have to simplify the problem, it's an NP-complete uh, optimization problem and you have to find some tricks and uh, there are a number of tricks including optimizing for an average Monday morning for example or for a soccer game or whatsoever and then you have these different programs for different types and you 
it poses this control on your system. So then drivers have to do what your supercomputer has determined is the best thing for them. All right. Now we had a completely different approach. We said let's now try to be a hundred percent optimal for a situation that never occurs. Let's try to be 90% optimal for the actual situation. Let's try to have a flexible response to the actual traffic situation. So basically what we came up with uh, is an idea that was actually inspired by a self-organization that we observed in pedestrian crowds where we found at the uh, door or as you can see over here, that there were oscillations of the flow directions pretty much as if there was a traffic light, <coughs> although there was none. So there was a, a self-organization based on the pressure built up and release that finally created these oscillations. We said, can't we transfer this principle to an intersection, have it organize its oscillations itself? And we did that, and we did it in a way that traffic lights also coordinated a little bit with the neighboring traffic lights, because it's just every traffic light does the best thing locally for that very intersection. It's like the traffic light was selfish and would not care about what the other traffic lights around were doing. And it turns out that is really not working well, so you need to have this <laughs> additional element of uh, coordination. And then look how beautiful uh, this is organizing. You get these green waves, it means platoons of cars can cross many intersections without having to stop. And, and then if we show actually what happens, uh, green now represents a green light in north-south or south-north direction and red means a green light in east-west or west-east direction. Then you can see this synchronization island. So neighboring traffic lights are coordinating with each other. But this pattern is changing all the time because it's responding to the actual local traffic situation. It's a very flexible scheme. If you have too much flexibility, it's not working well. If you have too much coordination, it's also not working well. So you have to find the right balance. And that is actually what we managed uh, to find. Uh, maybe I should skip the details over here. Um, but we have now applied it actually to a real messy situation, which is traffic in Germany. So we don't have these beautiful Manhattan street networks, uh, all, all sort of all and so on. But we have a street network like this one. And basically, the road authorities have given up on this area. <laughs> <laughs> they do have actually a system, a very expensive one, a state-of-the-art <coughs> control that has even a number of green waves in it. But they're still not happy with that because there, as you can see, so many trams and bus lines cutting through this area, and they would like to prioritize public transport. So. This is what they don't manage to do, but we managed to do so. So basically we came up uh, with a new control, and here's just a small video that's uh, comparing the old system with the new one. And you can see here's more traffic jams, and here jams go much earlier, and so on and so on. And you could say, okay, maybe this is just a good snapshot you now of the whole simulation. But it, it turns out that overall it's working much better. Actually, for everybody, for public transport, for individualized traffic, and for pedestrians and cyclists. So everybody is benefiting from this flexibility. All right? Beautiful. <laughs> Still, traffic is uh, comparatively simple as compared to the, the real world, say, a social system or an economic system. So, we now have to address the, the real big challenges. In order to do so, we have to bring different kinds of data together.
such as demographic data, transport data, geographic data, and so on. And then on the other hand, we need to have multi-level models that uh, bring together network models with agent-based models and whatever models are needed in order to reflect the real world. And then we have to bring data and models together and only in this way we can actually do simulations and scenario analysis and so on and so on. And um, that is certainly one approach that one can take but it requires lots and lots of data. And that was not possible in the past. Basically, you know, it took years to get a book of data. Because if you wanted to make a survey, really, you needed a lot of patients, and you ended up with a few numbers, basically. Now, we have new data sources, remote sensing, the internet, satellites, telecommunication, prediction markets, GPS data, social networks, web to zero, sensor networks, second life, and you name it, all this. And there are really exciting projects going on at MIT at the moment where the new technologies that are allowed to collect data about so many things we're doing if we agree that these data are collected about our activities. And all these data can be used to learn new things about social and economic systems and actually not only calibrate models but also validate them to even uh, to make a data driven modeling approach and to have uh, real time simulation of situations feeding in data in real time. So all of this will become possible within the next 10 years. And um, so that, that is the challenge basically to bring the data and the supercomputing power together. And then what can we do with that basically? Now our goal is to come up with what we call a living earth simulator. And a living earth simulator can be maybe compared with a, a flight simulator for politics and economics. And in fact, um, if you look around and it turns out we're using computers for everything. If we design a car, a plane, or new medical trucks, computers are being used in order to predict in advance how the car will behave, how the plane will fly, it will be efficient, how costly it will be, and all these kind of things. So we're checking this out with computers. We're not doing that when we take policy decisions, in most of the cases at least. Uh, it seems we're lacking tools to address the challenges we're having. And uh, the problem is that neither we can build on our experience because we're facing new problems, nor can we rely on our intuition uh, because complex systems, as I told you before, are behaving in a counterintuitive way. So we need new methods and tools to help our imagination uh, to inform ourselves and to take better decisions. And how could it work? Now, first of all, we need, of course, to collect a lot of data, such as financial data and so on, social data, and that need to be mined in order to find advanced warning signs of potential crises, but also opportunities, of course. And then once we detect something interesting, we'll explore that. We'll explore that by supercomputer simulations, but also actually by lab experiments and web experiments with now, all the means we have, including, by the way, uh, multiplayer online games such as Second Life, but a serious version of it. So basically, hundreds of thousands of people are spending their spare time every day in these virtual worlds. Why should we build a virtual world that looks like our real world? And then actually not just have one copy, we have a number of copies which are a little bit different in a number of aspects. So we could actually try different financial architectures or different voting systems or whatever you're interested in. Just check it out basically. 
you know, let's explore these different worlds, these different copies of our possible future and see how we like it. <coughs> and take the one you like most. That is basically a pro. So, I have these three different pillars like uh, data mining, supercomputer simulation, and this participatory exploration of possible futures we're going to take in order to get a better picture of uh, what might happen in the future if we do this or that. Okay, and uh, that requires, however, to take into account many different areas of society and economics, in particular the financial system, so we'll create a, what we call an interactive observatory, we could call it even an exploratory of um, financial systems. We'll do so for conflicts and wars, for health risks, for social well-being, for transport and logistics, for environmental change, and so on and so on. Uh, and we'll build it around people who do have the experience to mine a large amount of data and to run large computer simulations and then we'll integrate it in order to come up with this living or simulator, this flight simulator that I indicated before. So we need to integrate our knowledge. It's not enough to have uh, this disciplinary knowledge that we're having today because one system feeds back on another system if you're improving or optimizing one part of the system that may have very negative impacts and often unexpected ones on other parts of the system so we need to get the systemic picture of the world by putting our knowledge from different areas together so this is the grand challenge now, many people say, okay, I've been studying traffic and pedestrians before, and now you want to uh, understand the whole world. Well, uh, it's not myself who is doing that. As I indicated before, there are hundreds of teams who will be contributing to that. Um, then there's this other thing, like uh, the real world is so much more complex um, do you think you can make some progress over here? And here is an example where we made some progress and we saved lives of people actually with this progress. Actually, the, the point is and some people ask, okay, um, can you ever reach this goal to have this global simulation and so on and so on? And this is not the question actually. The question is can we make progress in terms of understanding our world better and avoid some of the mistakes we've made in the past. I mean many of these mistakes are very costly, so they cost hundreds of billions um, of dollars and actually the financial crisis cost 20,000 billions of dollars. So if you make a very small progress that will pay back a multiple of the cost of this project already. So even if we would only make a 0.1% improvement on reducing war and conflict, financial crisis and many other issues that are worrying us, that would already pay off. And we don't need to simulate everything to make such a progress, but simulation will be very helpful. So, um, here's a system that is very difficult actually to understand, where people have been dying in the past many times. So, every two or three years there was a crowd disaster in Mecca uh, during the annual pilgrimage. So, there are three million of people going to Mecca every year. And they do their religious duties, which extends over many days actually. It's a quite complicated procedure. It starts off in Mecca, a holy mosque where you're circling around the mosque uh, called Tabar, and then you have to go to Mina over there, and there you can see a tent city actually um, that. Uh, provides space for about 1.5 million people, but altogether there's 3 million people actually. And here they're performing a religious ritual which is called stoning the devil. And the devil is represented by those pillars that uh, you can see one of them over there. 
Um, so actually, it represents the temptation by the devil. And you ought to resist this temptation. So in order to demonstrate that, you're supposed to throw a number of small stones against these pillars. All right, you can see that there have been extremely high densities in the past, and as a consequence of that, um, hundreds of people have died over the years, and it was very difficult to get control of that situation. And uh, so, we were asked, because I am a pedestrian crowd expert, we were asked to analyze the situation. And in one year, it happened that a camera was just above the area where another crowd disaster happened, most astonishingly in a free area. So it's not confined, people are walking onto this ramp of the so-called Jamara bridge over there, this ramp is 40 meter wide. And still the crowd accident happened over there. Now if you do an analysis, it turns out and there still was something like a bottleneck because the flows were coming from different directions and so the density became higher and uh, we actually discovered that eventually there were two unexpected transitions in the dynamics of the flow one from a fluid flow towards a stop and go flow which I can demonstrate you over here it was actually not known for a long time that there was stop and go traffic at all in pedestrians. It works very differently uh, than among cars. Um, and then there is another transition towards what we call a turbulent uh, crowd condition. And there the density is so high that people are squeezed in between other people. They're pushed around so the forces uh, add up basically. And what happens is that you cannot anticipate the direction and size of the forces, so it's very difficult actually to respond to that situation, and very easy you can fall down, and then other people around you cannot stop, you will be trampled most likely. So that is what happens, and then uh, hundreds of people were dying. Um, and here is actually not a picture of people dying, but a picture of the uh, crowd turbulent, you can see that the crowd is shaking around, which makes it so difficult to stay on your feet. That is actually what triggered the crowd disaster, and actually it also triggered the crowd disaster during the love parade in Germany last year, and I'm currently in the process of analyzing uh, the details of that disaster. Now what was done at that time is a completely new design uh, for the Jamara bridge was um, implemented, and you can see there are many different entrance ramps in order to separate flow directions and many other design features in order to improve safety. But in order to make this one billion dollar investment work, the whole area had to be reorganized after 1,400 and some more years of the hatch. In order to come up with a good plan for this organization, we had to take into account hundreds of factors. Cultural, historical, religious, economic, whatever factors. And uh, so, so many solutions that seemed plausible would not work because one of those constraints. There were so many people who had to take decisions and so on. But in the end, uh, a new organization was implemented in that very year where I was involved, not anymore in this project, and many things have changed. But uh, what happened is that a one-way organization was introduced, and it changed the situation from that situation where emergency vehicles had difficulties getting ahead into the situation on the lower right, where we have very well organized streams, it takes much less time to get towards the Jamara Bridge in back, so it's less crowded and people, pilgrims like it much more. There were many other measures taken, such as flow monitoring, automatic counting, 
then there is uh, adaptive rerouting in case there is some overload of certain streets. A scheduling, so not everybody would go when he wanted, but so there was a certain time when he would go, and so on and so on. So many measures were taken. And uh, since then, nothing happened, although I was just uh, advising this one here. So that was a $1 billion investment that paid off in terms of saving people's lives. All right, and uh, I believe actually we can make progress in a number of different areas. And um, here again, the 10 problems that I mentioned before, and on the right hand side, uh, there are a number of ideas how we could approach these problems in a novel way. Um, there's not enough time to go into details, but we think there are new ways of approaching the problems we're having. And uh, I'd like to say there is big science behind this, as is demonstrated by a number of publications in Nature, Science, PNS, and so on. And they're very bright people, so I think we can make some progress that is really worth investing the money. Now, in terms of grand scientific challenges, just focus on the network challenges. Um, in biology, we have this challenge to understand the web of life and the brain. A web of life is uh, deciphered now by the Human Genome Project, and, and the brain actually shall be deciphered by uh, a project of a colleague who wants to bring up as one of the flagships the Human Brain Project. And in psychology, of course, uh, the, challenge, the grand challenge is to understand consciousness. Not sure how closely the, the first two are coupled. Uh, hopefully, one could understand consciousness by a better understanding of the brain, but who knows? And then there are these three major challenges that Future ICT wants to address. The social science challenge to understand and manage social interactive systems in the evolution and resilient in a sustainable way. And then in economics, we design a more robust financial architecture. And finally, in computer science and engineering, to design a resilient, trust, and self organized system that promotes the co evolution of ICT in society. And finally, to develop a global scale privacy respect to reality mining to establish a planetary nervous system facilitating social awareness. In this context, I need to mention again Sandy Pentland, the course, this idea of coming up with a planetary nervous system uh, is very much promoted, I think. So this is what future ICT will do, create the Living Earth platform, which contains also the participatory element that will be made up also from these crisis observatories for a number of different areas. We'll create an innovation accelerator, we'll learn to manage complexity and new search and start as it will be developed. And so I'm finishing this talk with this trailer. Thank you for your attention.